Uh, my name is Laura Thomas. I am the Assistant Director for Competitive Sports here at the University of Alabama. We're so excited to see so many of y'all on the um, call. We've got 100 and the numbers keep going up. So we'll see uh, what we can top out at. But um, for those of you that this is your first round table or um, to call into, we want to just cover some expectations really quick. Uh, this call is being recorded and we'll post on the nurse website for any of you or those colleagues that want to review um, or want, were unable to call in to the call today. Um, please ensure that you're on mute if you're not speaking, uh, just to make sure that there's no static or um, background noise. I know, for instance, I've got my two dogs, so I'm going to try and stay on mute in case they go berserk. Um, but just to get back to it, remember that this is a safe space um, in a time of uncertainty as we are right now. We want to make sure to be respectful to all participants. And then we have got some, um, this is kind of a space to share ideas. We've got some talking points. Uh, myself and the content experts developed some, some bullet points for us to cover, but we also want to talk about what y'all want to talk about. Um, it's not all about us sharing. So please um, feel welcome to share anything or ask questions in the chat. I will be moder moderating that um, and I will look to see if there's any questions that maybe we hadn't talked about or weren't on our agenda for today and we'll bring those up. Um, for those of you that were not on the round table last time, you know that I will call on you if you submit some questions. And so if you would rather me not, please just direct message me um, or just say in the chat, like, I don't have an answer for this question. I'm just looking for some feedback. And so before we get everything started, though, I think we should introduce our content experts again. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Aaron Elder, and I'm the graduate assistant of Sports Clubs and Inclusive Recreation at James Madison University. Hi, I'm Wendy Shepard. I'm the assistant director of sports and risk management at the University of Richmond in Virginia. Good afternoon. My name is Chad Zimmerman, senior assistant director for sport clubs at the University of Texas at Austin. Great, and I can't tell you how much fun we've had. Hi. Here. Hi, my name is Marina Gavilan, and I'm the Administrative Assistant for Recreational Sports for, from the University of Miami. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us. We're happy to have you here. So for the first topic, we wanted to kind of talk about something that we weren't able to really find an answer to last time, and that is, um, does anybody, specifically if Amy Rask is on the call, does anybody have a solution for the, the topic of getting equipment back or getting university owned? Um, apparel back from teams that are now off campus. I didn't know if anybody had come to a great answer to that. I know that we've got some limitations on different campuses, but I wanted to open up that uh, to begin our topic. <laughs> Amy says in the comment that she's still looking for answers. <laughs> so does anybody else um, have a good solution for how they've uh, gotten anything returned? A couple of people are saying they're sending some prepaid boxes or having students mail it. Well, cool. So y'all keep sending in any of those um, comments to hopefully help answer Amy's predicament, but then also all of ours that are, are kind of in the same situation. Um, so Chad, I think you wanna you wanna take the rest of it. Yeah, so we wanted to touch back on um, discussing any unique ways that we are engaging our student leaders, um, mostly or mainly from a sport club perspective. Uh, I think we've seen a lot of great ideas across the spectrum, um, a lot of fitness and wellness things, a lot of esports for intramurals, but what are we doing in the sport club world specifically? Um, just to start the discussion, we uh, at UT Rec Sports, we are beginning weekly hangouts for our elite sport club authorized representatives. Um, kind of like a podcast style, we'll, we'll review our news and updates of the last several days or weeks, what's been going on since March 13th roughly, but also a chance for more brainstorming and round tables like this, um, but specifically within our program. Uh, as, as well, with, in addition to that, um, we are creating sport club instruction, instructional videos and promotional videos for each of our clubs or as many that, that we can, um, you know, kind of get moving on it as quickly as they, they can. So depending on what their capabilities are with hardware and software, um, and if they have coaches, instructors, or, or students that are capable of doing these videos, but 
um, various sports like our ballroom dance club putting together a how to two step or um, our tennis club putting together uh, backhand and forth, forehand fundamentals. Um, those are just two examples. But I was wondering if anybody else wanted to share unique ways that they are engaging their sport club audience on campus. Yeah, I'm chime, I'll chime in on this one. Um, Dominique Sack, coordinator of uh, club sports and summer camps at YSU. Um, so we had plans on having a banquet and the overarching theme that we wanted to focus on is morale and increasing morale. A lot of seniors are um, missing out on their senior seasons and um, in, in our cases, a lot of our club sports are doing well. But um, we wanted to keep on the plan of the banquet and having it virtual. Um, so that we're still highlighting success and achievements, we're engaging the clubs, and we're, we're building that camaraderie that, that we were looking so hard for throughout the year. Um, and so bringing them all together for a common goal basically was what we were looking to do. Sweet, and I saw actually in our um, nursery communities, there was a post today by Scott Morrow at UCF, East Central Florida. Um, that they were looking still to do an end of year virtual banquet as well. I don't know if Scott's on the call today, but um, if anybody else had any ideas, just virtual hangouts or or any ways that, to connect with their sport club members. I also have some um, trick shot videos, which um, I'm looking to do myself, but pending sport shot videos. Gerard Davis here from Ohio State. Um, when the news broke of campus uh, closing in person and in our interactions, uh, we did an initial uh, town meeting, uh, which was similar to our sport club president's meeting, but more or less to give them more information about uh, some of the campus initiatives that had taken place uh, to close campus and then all of the, the status of their events, whether they were traveling or whether they were home events. Um, and then something informal that I did, I saw this from the East Carolina Twitter account of other women's sport club, other women's soccer club. Uh, I saw them kind of bouncing a soccer ball around, doing some juggling tricks, and I tagged our women's Ohio State soccer club um, in a post and challenged them to do the same thing, and they ended up doing it about uh, three days later. So I thought that was something cool to kind of keep them engaged uh, with them, with not only them but also other. Uh, like clubs around the country. So um, if that's something that people are interested in, uh, I can kind of share that message thread through Twitter. Um, and I think it'd be really cool to see the number of clubs we get involved. Um, Jack and Plotty from Sac State. Um, we are doing a couple different things. We're also looking at doing a virtual banquet. Um, still trying to figure out what that's going to look like. Definitely going to highlight winners and finalists for awards on social media. Um, but also trying to do some type of video type banquet um, in place of the actual banquet. Um, we're doing bi-weekly check-in meetings with our presidents. We had one meeting and took a poll to see if they wanted to do it again, and they did. So we're doing them every other week, and it's kind of a check-in how you're feeling and then playing some like online games with them, um, which is fun and a good way to connect with them. And a little bit different from the normal sport club vibe of like always trying to get them to do things paperwork wise. It's a little more fun getting to, to meet them. And we, um, there was something else that someone said that I was going to join in on, but I forgot what it was. Oh, we did an Instagram challenge too. Um, we did a sit up challenge and tagged some officers and um, clubs and they, some of them, about half of them, I would say joined in too, which was fun. Yeah, Megan, I'm sorry, I don't know how to say your last name, Go Foyle <laughs> said that she's doing a sports club's cup um, list of challenges. Do you mind sharing like what challenges y'all are doing with that for social media? <laughs> yeah, no problem. This is Megan Gilfoyle here from uh, so. Irvine. Uh, this was actually an idea that I kind of stole from Amy at DU. <laughs> Hi, Amy. Um, so this is something that we made. It's just a list of 15 challenges. It's all things that they can do from their own space and whatever they can do collaboration wise, just post it in a similar 
post. I don't really know how they're going to go about that, but it's just something for them to get their minds off of other things that they're usually doing for club sports. So it's things like doing exercise videos that we're posting on our homepage, our, our campus rec homepage, um, making arts and crafts <laughs> that's related to their own clubs, like kind of silly things, but um, also just staying in touch with one another within their clubs. Cause I know a lot of them are stressed out. They don't really want to be focused on fun things. So I'm just giving them an opportunity to think of something else. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. Sorry, I messed up your name. <laughs> That's the beauty of it. There's no such thing as stealing in NERSA. I think we're all sharing ideas and probably just learning as we go, um, especially with a lot of these things. So I'll probably steal quite a bit from the rest of this conference call today. Um, but to stay on the, on the lines of student engagement, Aaron had a couple of questions and a couple of different points um, at JMU. Yeah, thank you, Chan. Uh, so what we're doing right now, what we're in the midst of is our officer transitions being moved virtually. Um, so usually we have our officer transitions back in March and now, now it's being April. Uh, so usually if it was typical, we would have our elections for each club be held in March and we're reported to the SEC uh, secretary. But me and my supervisor just like made a a decision like to not to put them that strain on her because she is also going through the transition of having her classes online and her schedule being out of whack. So I took on the responsibility of reaching out to each club, just making sure walking them through the process of having the elections, make sure everything is done fairly, uh, make sure everyone is have a, have a voice who wants to run for president, vice president, treasurer, secretary. Um, and then to like for each year to ensure like a smooth transition for officers, we would have like all the officers like required to attend a workshop scheduled by the SEC at the beginning of next year. Um, and so they would send, they would have to send their new officers list into a Google sheet uh, that would be sent to our Google Drive. Um, and then I would input them into a spreadsheet and then send it um, in. Um, but yeah, I would like to see how everyone else is doing with their officer transitions, if you have any thoughts. Hey Aaron, it's Brian Stelzer from Nebraska. Um, we've got, uh, thankfully we, we use Campus Labs and we're gonna encourage all our people to uh, be utilizing that elections function. Um, thankfully to our student involvement and then myself as well, are gonna be putting some Zoom trainings together for those incoming officers um, so much as so that we can be help, hopefully um, ready to go in August when we're all up and running again, because I'm optimistic like that. Ryan, we have campus labs on our campus as well. I'm sure a lot of others do. Have you ever used the election function before or are you familiar, getting familiar with it now? Um, and if you've used it, can you just briefly describe how that works for us? I have used it, um, used it in person mostly for our uh, sport club council and the board members that are currently helping me sit through uh, our budget process so that we're, we're sitting through our allocations through zoom which i was planning on anyway um and recording them for the people that can't make it so that's been been really helpful um so it, it's reasonably straightforward you, you go in and it works like creating an event um you click through the process and say this is what we're voting for and then um provide their different options and so the students themselves would go in there and put anybody that wants to be nominated as an officer and so um, in that, so in the organization function, it, there's a gavel that says elections next to it. Click on that when you're in your organization process and it's pretty easy from there. Makes sense. And is that something like you could probably do on Google Forms as well? Uh, yeah, I'm sure you could do it on Google as well. It's just one of those, if they wanted to put it through something that you're already using, um, we're trying to make a point to funnel people towards Campus Labs, it's kind of, it's still new to campus for us. So we really want to make sure that we're um, shoving them that direction as much as possible so that they get more used to it, especially um, in the situation we're in now, just trying to get them on the online software that we're using. Well, thank you for sharing. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and move to the next topic. So since 
our sports clubs are often like very physical and rely on in-person meetings. How do y'all plan on like keeping participation and club engagement going while most of the clubs like won't be able to meet? Hey there, it's, this is Tony Perez from Chico State um, in Northern California. Over here, we're, um, uh, I'm the coordinate, sport club coordinator for our program. And I'm uh, uh, sending them a bunch of uh, um, three times a week workout videos, things to get uh, hit videos, um, videos for them to, you know, kind of just stay in shape. And in those, uh, those links I'm sending out to them, I mean, I encourage them to uh, uh, set up a Zoom uh, meeting with all of their, either just their officers or their, their sport club, their general sport club members and say, hey, maybe you guys would enjoy this more if you did it, you know, set a time like, hey, we're going to do this at 7 a.m. We're going to do this workout at 7 a.m. that was sent to us so that they kind of still have that like camaraderie factor. Yeah, they're not there in person with them, but they can still talk to each other, talk about how hard that was, <laughs> um, and kind of bond over that, uh, uh, that workout. Um, we're also pushing them to uh, our intramural programming, who's uh, switched to a virtual, virtual 5K um, and other, you know, esports, which I found out a lot of our sport club members play video games. So um, we're pushing them towards those, uh, uh, e-sport leagues that we or that the intramurals department has set up. Well, thank you, Tony, for sharing. I know, like, one thing that we're trying to do over here at JMU uh, for, like, a potential, like, program educational session, it's, like, the idea around it would be, like, clubs would have something they could teach or create, like, a uh, short video on a topic. So, say, uh, club bat bass fishing would like to do, like, a video related to, like, poles or how to set bait. And not sure if they'd, like, discuss it with uh, see experts and then like create a video probably like 10 to 15 minutes and they will develop like a program plan to send out to work out all the details and I feel I do feel like a good opportunity for clubs because one it will be get some publicity, uh, publicity for some of the activities or some of them might not get that much exposure because they're a lesser known club and also it can be an educational uh, video for the students who like wants to learn um, about the different clubs so thank you. And so, Chad, would you like to go on to the next topic? Thanks, Aaron. So beyond student engagement, um, we had quite a few questions come through last week about uh, spending um, and different financial concerns related to um, will allocation funds be available to you? And if they are, um, do you expect spending freezes? And just how are we, how are different departments navigating that? Um, so I know Mario Rios at Texas State has some different things going on with spending, the spending topic I was going to call on Mario. Sure, um, hopefully everyone can see the uh, awesome people that are behind me. I think two of them are actually here on this call today. So yes, eat them up cats. Um, uh, in terms of spending, I know there's a lot of discussion going on here at Texas State. Uh, Rick, whoa, um, something's going on here. Uh, Anyway, uh, as I try and get my focus back. Uh, so there's a lot of discussion here at Texas State regarding spending and what that's gonna look like. And right now we've been asked to just basically hold off on any spending and you know, whether or not we get that money back or not is, is something that's uh, still up in the air. Uh, I'm kind of very, I guess, negative on the fact that maybe we would, we would be able to spend uh, the money that we had allocated for our clubs through our state funding here at Texas State. Uh, there are going to be a few things that we do owe to like certain leagues or certain things that we will do to transition over to uh, obviously pay those. So there is obviously the opportunity for that to happen. Um, but I think there's a lot of questions with, you know, the fact, you know, that we get funding from students from a student fee that we looks like may not get over the summer uh, with us going to online classes in summer one. We haven't made the full-fledged, uh, I guess, going to online for the entire summer, uh, but uh, that might be something that'll be coming down the road and how that will affect not only sport clubs, 
uh, but uh, campus recreation in general is something that I think that is probably on the minds of a lot of people right now. Uh, as far as the fall's concerned, you know, a lot of what we're going through right now is obviously the summer is going to be very affected and how is the, how's the fall going to look like uh, in terms of having people back on campus paying that fee and then obviously having those fees go to fund our programs in campus recreation and sport clubs in general. Obviously, we know that our clubs do a lot of fundraising, or at least that's what they're supposed to be doing uh, when it comes to uh, running their organizations. But uh, I think a lot of the, there's a lot of uncertainty out there. And I guess I'd like to hear from others, knowing that there's a lot of uncertainty here in terms of sport clubs. What uh, are your campuses doing when it comes to funding? What sort of fundraising initiatives are going on? Uh, or is there any money that you got, you know, going towards other resources that aren't going to your clubs? So right now we have not had the, had, had, had anyone ask us move money towards other places on campus. It's just mainly keeping it within campus recreation to see what we can do over the course of this fiscal year, which for us ends at the end of August. So I'll obviously just point it out to or send it out to everybody else who would like to chime in about their spending and what they can do on their campuses. Uh, I know at the University of Richmond, we are we're still working under the uh, the idea that we can spend our our funds. Uh, there is some talk going on that a freeze is is coming, so we've been encouraged to spend what funds we have while we still can uh, and whatnot. And I do feel the pressure to do that uh, as soon as possible. Uh, I know that a lot of people are still trying to to figure that out, and I'm not quite sure uh, who else in our department. I know that a, a few of us you know, um, are, are looking for ways to, to spend that appropriately, not to take advantage of some of the funding that we probably didn't expect to have at this point. You know, our, our end of the year event was canceled. So the money that I had put towards our banquet, you know, we recovered that, which is good. But unfortunately, um, we we're just trying to make sure that the way that we do spend it moving forward um, is responsible and in the best interest of our program. That being said, uh, you know, um, there are still a lot of options and, and possibilities that we can use it. We just got to figure out how to do it quickly. Um, to piggyback onto what Mario was saying, uh, I, but the question I wanted to ask a lot of people were if the clubs had leftover allocated funds, if your program is still allowed to spend it, um, how are you, are you able to roll it over into the next fiscal year? Um, are they being able to spend it now? Uh, I can say from, from our standpoint, uh, at Richmond, we are not going to be able to roll over any of our allocated funds. They have to be spent uh, <laughs> either before the end of our fiscal year, which will be July 1 for us, or before this freeze happens. Um, and I, I met with our sport club council last night and told them that they had until next Friday to hopefully put some stuff together and send it through to get um, approved. But same, same rules apply to, you know, to not take advantage of, uh, of, you know, buying frivolous stuff that they need to use it in the best interest of the, the club moving forward. But I'd be really interested to hear if, uh, for those of you that are able to do it, if, you're, if you've got, you know, what possibilities that you have or what you're suggesting to your clubs. We can uh, go to our friend over there at VCU, Michael Potter again. Um, he said that VCU is unable to roll it over. So Mike, Michael, have y'all thought of any creative ways outside of just like the money that was gonna be used to travel um, on what had to spend that? Um, we're meeting with our sport club council also to have some conversations about some different ways to, for them to spend those funds. We're having a lot of conversations with our clubs about um, being very intentional about if they need to either order new uniforms to get those uniforms uh, ordered. Uh, several of our clubs looking to complete some equipment orders. Um, actually just had conversations with our soccer clubs. Um, we're going to create uh, a tax, because we're tax exempt, a tax exempt account with um, soccer.com, I think, where they can order some new soccer balls, pennies, and cones um, uh, with their allocation funds before the year ends. So, uh, being very, just being very intentional about communicating with the clubs about, hey, you have this much money left over. Uh, these are some of the ways we think you should, you know, look to complete this, you know, use up these funds before the year ends. Uh, we have not heard of any spending freezes yet. Um, that's money that was uh, allocated to the clubs from student government. Um, so we're kind of just waiting to see what happens with that. Um, but we're 
sending out forms to our clubs if they're looking to make purchases for them to complete that. And then we're reaching out to them to initiate that conversation about how to go about making those payments. Um, since our check cutting process has been kind of slowed down drastically. So are we able to make these as P-card purchases? Um, what accounts they're using? So different things like that. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. I know with the University of Alabama, we're on a freeze, and so we're not able to do any of that. But for those of y'all that are still able to spend, um, I think it's definitely worth looking at some, some ways in which you can spend the money that was allocated for travel or whatnot. Um, I'm curious to see if anyone has reached out to any of the governing bodies to see if they could potentially use the funds that they have now for next year's dues or league dues for a future season. Laura, before I move on from that, can I make a statement? Absolutely. I would say as you guys, for those schools that do have the opportunity to still have access to allocated funds, be thinking big picture about what that really means and being good stewards to the clubs because ultimately that's our goal as sport club professionals, but being good stewards to the department and knowing that like, oh, hey, I'm going to let this club try to spend as much money as possible may not be in the best interest of the department. And really having some intentional conversations with your supervisor uh, or your director and saying, hey, we have this much money left over. How much can we, how much should, should and could we be giving that back to the department because maybe our summer camps are canceled and that revenue is not coming in or we're not able to charge and we had to give much money. Uh, maybe you're paying for intramurals and you're having to give money back. Think of those ways of how it can offset some of the losses revenue wise that all of our departments are going to be facing here in the next few months. Um, so being conscious of that as you guys make those decisions as good club sports professionals, I, I think is going to be really important in the next few months. But that was just my input. Um, we're at a freeze at the University of Houston as well. So I don't even can make a good decision. But if I was in the opportunity, I would definitely be thinking about that and how how I could be helping the department not only traveling the club. So that's my soapbox. Um, <clears throat> well, thanks, John, for getting on your soapbox. Um, no, I'm just kidding. That's a really great perspective and um, really a good holistic approach to have. So thank you for sharing. Um, great. Do we want, are we still talking about spending or do we want to move on? How are we feeling? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Keep moving on. Hey, Laura. Yes, Jason. Is, uh, Jason Darby at Southern Miss. You had mentioned uh, before John's comment about the uh, governing body for some of the, the sport clubs and, and the, the dues or fees they may have paid. Mm -hmm. uh, just some information, if you are not aware and you do have a rugby sport club, uh, USA Rugby actually filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy last week. Um, and they have gone ahead and informed uh, all the clubs that they will not be refunding their, their SIP payments or their dues or anything like that. So so just so you all are aware of that. And so moving forward, that organization may look entirely different. Um, but as far as, as refunds or anything, they've already said they're not going to be going that route. Jason, I think that's a great point, too. Thank you for sharing that. I think that many of y'all are have been in communication with some of the governing bodies. I know personally, I've received a lot of emails that look like they go out to most club representatives of our region or across the nation from CEOs and all of that. So just be aware of the status of the league before I guess you commit uh, financial resources to that season that may or may not happen. But again, I'm an eternal optimist. So I'm hopeful that these seasons will, will happen in the fall. But um, Wendy, do you want to keep going down the um, topic of national governing bodies? Sure. Um, I know one of the questions I would I wanted to pose. I've been having some conversations with a couple of the um, of the groups, specifically like USA Rugby that it, I'm sorry USA Ultimate that reached out to talk about um, moving championships in the fall, uh, if and when they're able to get them moving again. Whether or not programs will allow recently graduated seniors to come back and participate. I know they specifically asked me if our university would be open to that and uh, we do have a policy at Richmond that says that it uh, sport clubs are only open to current students, full-time students. So that would go against our normal policy, but I know I, uh, I would definitely be open to a conversation. These students have been through the ringer this spring and uh, they would have earned the right if they do qualify for that tournament to be given an opportunity to participate. Uh, I know USA Ultimate mentioned to me that they would uh, only allow students that were already on a pre-approved roster from this fall that they were given to their program would be eligible to participate in that tournament. 
if and when it's scheduled in the fall. So that was that was a way to offset some of that concern. But obviously, risk you know risk management liability is a big picture issue that we all need to be aware of. And so I'm very interested to hear if you guys have been having those conversations, and if so, what they look like for your campus uh, moving forward. Can I just add to that question a little bit? Um, because you brought up a good point about the risk management aspect, our risk management, uh, or all the CSUs actually sh uh, should be purchasing um, um, insurance for their athletes. And so that's the big concern why if say a senior graduates this, this year and they're looking to have their, and their governing body is looking to have their championship next fall, um, why we wouldn't allow that with other reasons, but why they, the big reason why we wouldn't allow them to participate with the club, even though they did qualify is because they're, we no longer purchase uh, insurance because they're not a, a, um, a student at the university anymore. So if, for those of you that do, that do believe that their program would allow it, I kind of want to know, do they, does your university purchase insurance for those athletes? And are those athletes that you, would be allowed to compete uh, uh, would you be purchasing insurance for them? Tony, this is Sarah from Cal Poly. How's it going? Hi, um, nice hey, you, you too. Um, we are, I told USA Ultimate that I would allow them to play uh, in the fall um, because we have paperwork in place for, you know, visiting teams to fill out as waivers. Or for example, if men's rugby club wants to play a friendly against the local rugby football team, you know, they can sign a waiver. And so my plan is to allow those graduating players to participate under that off-campus non-student waiver. And we will not be purchasing insurance for them just to answer that part of your question too. Thank you. So just uh, in the chat, I see a couple of different questions about some specific governing bodies, um, some different view or some different questions about the NCBA, um, NCBF volleyball, um, MCLA lacrosse. Um, just a, a helpful reminder or tip, if, if you do get any email communication from these bodies, it'd be helpful maybe to post for others in the nursing um, communities in case they don't receive those emails. Um, it's, just more digest feed information that we can share with one another. Um, but it looks like most are providing refunds or in the process of making that decision, which is always interesting um, to me right now. I know I assist with uh, the Texas Collegiate Soccer League um, and we've decided to roll spring dues over to the fall or really let the club decide if they want to refund it now too, if they have another need for that money. Um, so it's really, a lot of us are in that boat either as sports officials ourselves or as governing bodies, you know, volunteers too. So um, I would just recommend as best as possible. If everybody can, can work with one another. I think everybody's going to be in the same boat when it comes time for, you know, reinvigorating everybody and getting these events restarted. Got a question. This is Ty from Kennesaw State. Um, is there any concern of clubs participating while on this suspension? Uh, a couple of these leagues, I feel, have been a little slow on the trigger. I don't know if there's any current leagues that are, that are still having active participation. I think the NCBA leagues have been slow on the trigger. They haven't actually come out with a and they're looking to do an updated stance. Gymnastics was pretty slow, but is there any concern about clubs going out and competing, whether it be independent competition or, or uh, forms of league co competition? Thanks, Ty, for asking. I know that I saw in the feed, um, Andrea with um, UCF said that they're on a travel ban and the University of Alabama is as well. So students are not allowed to travel on behalf of the university. Um, so I think that really is where the, the concerns lie for at least me. And it sounds like, I don't wanna speak for you at UCF, but um, if 
if y'all don't mind sharing. Uh, this is Jerome Davis from Ohio State. I know around our region, uh, a lot of local partners in which our some of our clubs would use to uh, participate in contests if they could not get space on campus, uh, whether it be a local park within Columbus City Zoom Rec, uh, a lot of those uh, entities are not allowing large groups to like hold any type of contracts to rentals. So that hasn't really been an issue uh, in this part of uh, the country. Yeah, it's looking like most of us have suspended or, or canceled travel or events. And so um, there's obviously varying levels of concern from all the different campus perspectives and stuff. But y'all just keep the comments coming. These are great. Um, it helps us get a good idea of what we're kind of thinking through. Um, I know MCLA had come up once, too. I don't know if anybody has heard specifically about lacrosse leagues. Um, And if not them, another I, question for the group. Um, when I met with my lacrosse, both I mean, lacrosse okay, teams, so they both said they were canceled. Okay, but don't they, I mean, like MCLA has some pretty high league fees that like cover like officials costs and stuff that aren't happening. Like, have we heard anything like of like how they're gonna get some of that money back or if they're rolling over? I, you might not have any of the answer, but I was just curious if anyone yeah, they still haven't heard yet. And I, my son's best friend is actually on the team, so they're all still waiting to hear back on how they're going to do dues, do dues. <laughs> and yeah, thank y'all for sharing again. I think that this is all great. And one thing that I have to remind myself is that just as long as it took the university to figure out what to do or what we are doing as a, as a university, the leagues are in the same situation, right? Like this is a this is uncharted territory for all of us. Um, so I know that a lot of leagues have already decided or governing bodies have already decided, but um, let's hopefully give them a little bit of patience with um, making that decision because especially for those those leagues that have complexities like the MCLA with like paying for officials dues that are not occurring, like that's a little more complex than um, we didn't play, here's your money back. My one other question, or just on the topic of okay, the governing so bodies. What I did... Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Okay, I will go. Uh, <laughs> uh, how will uh, how will we handle uh, any sort of eligibility decisions that are are handed down by these uh, governing bodies? For example, if if extra years are granted. Um, will that affect participation eligibilities in your program at all or, or not? I was just wondering if anybody had thoughts there. I, I don't see us being able to allow them to play unless we really fight hard, but because we're funded by student fees, I just don't, I don't see that happening. Yeah, Dan Gardner from William & Mary. I see that um, I see that being a huge conversation with student leaders as NGBs kind of gradually start communicating out um, eligibility updates. Um, th there'll be like recurring conversations, like club to club as that goes. Um, we're all kind of within the box of um, whatever recognized student orgs um, eligibility is. So I think a lot of us are probably in the same boat there. I think that'll be a big conversation to have about um, you know how to how to define expectations for that going into next year luckily i think that's a bigger mess for our athletics friends and not as much for our sport clubs because i think most of us are in agreement that we would maintain a, a student eligibility piece for our participation so um thanks yeah. for answering those and um i did have one oh, go ahead laura um yeah at at pacific we've had i've been 
I've had a lot of clubs want to at, like ask for community members or anything like that. And I've been shut down every time from risk management. So if that's not something that people have considered, I'm sure it is because we all think about risk management. Um, I, that's not even as much as I would love to do that for the seniors of extending eligibility. Um, I don't even think, I think that would be completely out of the question because our risk management office has always said that anybody who's not a current student or um, just can't play period due to our uh, risk and insurance liabilities. Yeah, thank you. I think also one of the interesting elements of this conversation in the future, because we haven't had too many announcements on eligibility, will be, is there a potential disconnect between what the leagues are trying to achieve with what eligibility processes that they put down and then what we are actually able to do? Um, so if y'all, I would encourage anyone on the call that if you have a good relationship or if you volunteer with some of these governing bodies, um, potentially reach out to them and just share the fact that like, most of our campuses would not allow these students to compete. And so just making sure that we're connected and united towards the students um, from governing bodies. I know that we've got different types of relationships with all of them, um, some really good and some really challenging. But that's just one other thing to note that if you do have a connection in some of those leagues and they're in that process of having an eligibility conversation, um, try to encourage them or share what our side of that story looks like and what it would potentially look like. Hey, hey, Laura, this is Ty again. One league that I can think of that has pretty uh, lenient eligibility and allows after graduation is the fishing leagues. You can qualify for a national championship, and then once you graduate, if you qualify, they allow participation. So I think that's one league that comes to mind right away that maybe we can start a conversation with of that's not really – conducive to our campuses to allow someone to participate in nationals after they've graduated. Yeah, and I think one other, just to add a layer of complexity to this, is that if, if some campuses can support those students that are no longer actual students and others cannot, then that just makes the playing field less, I guess, equitable and not as fair across the board. So um, Whatever the leagues, obviously individual leagues will make different decisions, but whatever they decide, it has major implications. And so that's what trying to get out ahead of this um, would really be ideal if you have some of those connections. I see Val posted in the comment section that the Champ Series plans to have standards uh, work team look at it. And so I don't know, Val, if you wanted to share a little bit more um, about just kind of educating us on that, that decision and, and how we all are working through that. It'll start in June when we get the new standards work team going. So we have had a couple inquiries. So Danny Fitel will be running that. And so I'm sure that the work team will reach out, but there's nothing to really report except that it, it'll, it will come up with a new term. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I know that we're seeing a lot of really great comments in here. Um, I think this is great stuff. Thank you so much. One thing that was commented on in um, the chat section was about coaches, and that leads us to our next talking point. So it's just a great transition. Um, so some of the comments are in here about, are we doing anything for coaches or instructors at this time? Obviously, all of our institutions have some different um, regulations when it comes to those coaches, you know, some are employees, some are not, some are just truly volunteer, um, this, that, and the other, but I didn't know if anyone is working with them with, um, you know, virtual recruitment or uh, virtual workouts or trainings or anything like that, if, if anybody had an idea that they wanted to share. I'll call on you, don't worry. Yeah, I'll, I'll share. I've been, this has been a lot of my time lately. So um, at Chico State, our coaches are uh, uh, at will employees or intermittent employees. So they're not full time. They're more like part time student staff, but not students. Um, and in order for us to to pay anyone here, we have to justify that they can work remotely and that um, what they're doing to, you know, get paid for um, what the club agreed to pay them. Um, and to do that, we um, had them take a series of compliance trainings through the universities, take coaching certifications, um, uh, more so than what we normally do. Because there's, at our university, we do have compliance trainings, we do have 
uh, some uh, governing bodies require them to have certain coaching certifications, but we're giving them additional coaching certifications that they can go do, uh, 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 do online, do additional trainings through the university, something to so that we can, at the end of the day, justify why we're paying these employees when in actuality, a majority of what they do is in person, on the field, in the pool, um, on the court. So um, we were, in order to be able to pair coaches, we provided those opportunities for them. Um, of course, there has been the fair, uh, fair amount of pushback from the coaches from having to do that work. Um, but at the end of the day, in order to get paid, they have to do that work, so. Great, thanks for sharing. And I know Catherine Hutchings, I'm not sure what university you're with, she posed the question and I didn't know if she had anything um, that you wanted to share about it or just kind of share what y'all are considering when y'all are talking about coaches and pay and responsibilities and expectations. Hey, Laura, Catherine Hutchings from Santa Clara University here. Most of our seasons are currently over. So, it, and I mean, the volleyball and lacrosse leagues still had potential to go on, but uh, the majority of their season had already concluded. So the team leaderships had already like decided that we were going to honor their initial agreement. And we have been, I've paid already most of the coaches for what was initially agreed upon. So we didn't hold back or cut anybody's payments due to the virus situation. Gotcha. Thank you for sharing. No problem. Yeah, I mean, at University of Richmond, we did the same. You know, our, I, we felt they, our coaches didn't stop working because they wanted to. I think the commitment that they had, you know, to the university was, um, you know, was there and whatnot. It's just unfor unfortunate circumstances. They would still be on our campus today covering practices or events if they could. Uh, we, we have stipends. Ours are not uh, actually hired through the university. So it's, it's a small amount that we give to the very few coaches that we have on campus. And we decided to go ahead and process their payments as normal. Uh, in, a, in, you know, in good faith, they need, you know, like a lot of people, a lot of them were expecting and needed this, uh, this financial assistance. So we were it was an easy decision for our campus to make. Great. Well, thank you all again for sharing. I think this is um, going really well. The next point that we kind of, um, as a content expert facilitator group, wanted to kind of talk on or at least touch on was we're talking a lot about what we're doing right now, but I think taking a step back and looking for fall 2020 planning, I know that's really important for us. Um, so is there anything that, um, any ideas out there for not necessarily like officer training or things that we've already discussed, but any ways that you can take time to highlight benefits of participating in sport clubs for fall recruitment or different efforts like that that anybody wanted to share? Or if there's any things that y'all are reflecting on um, adding or changing for fall based on some of the, I wouldn't consider it extra time, but newly allocated time um, that we're using to kind of uh, enhance or, or increase the efficiency of our work. This is, Laura, this is not something we're doing yet. It's something that I've thought about and to bring up kind of with my supervisor and other people, but I think a big loss to our university was a loss of our, one of our bigger on campus days, which would have been, I think, last weekend. Um, so I don't know fully what admissions and what kind of enrollment is doing around the loss of that and how to still get students on campus, because being a small private university, I think that is their main focus and our main concern right now is not only retention, but the concern over how many students we're gonna drop in our freshman class. Um, so that's what one thing that I'm hoping to bring up with my supervisor, and I don't really have an idea, any ideas for it yet, but I figured I'd put the thought in everybody else's mind of how can we still highlight whether it's our full recreation program or specifically student activities and sport clubs um, to those possible incoming students in a virtual way. I wanted yeah, to jump absolutely. in real quick, uh, Laura, and just say, mention that we I had a conversation with uh, a few of our clubs already, you know, the whole uh, aspect of new student orientation. We hosted, we host students here in our rec center 
basically every day, Monday through, I guess, Wednesday or Thursday from June all the way yeah, early June till, uh, I guess, mid to late June. And we're going to lose that opportunity to have our clubs interact with them, you know, in person. So we're obviously now forced to have, you know, you know, a virtual new student orientation going on for our students over the summer. So I just had a conversation earlier today with one of our clubs and we just talked about what NSO would look like. And, you know, just in just that conversation, you know, we're gonna ask and task our clubs to come up with some sort of video to add to either our campus recreation website, whether it's the new student orientation website that could be created to try and spread the word of, of you know, cause we use that opportunity to recruit, you know, you know, students coming into our programs. So that's something that, you know, I've written down here and that's something that we'll task our clubs over the next few weeks to get that ready since I believe our uh, orientation uh, summer would start June 1. I get, I think that's probably when they're gonna allow that to happen uh, for our students. But I think, you know, one of the ideas that I have also is what does onboarding look like for the fall look like? And we hope that everything's gonna go to normal, but what would happen if it actually isn't normal and how we would need to react to, you know, either, a, you know, a shrinking, uh, you know, pop student population on campus Maybe we're not able to start right away with anything. Um, those are things that I'm just playing around in my mind, just thinking how that would look like, even though we're trying to do the normal stuff that we would do over the course of a summer to prepare for the fall. Uh, just now with, like you said, extra allocated time to do that. Now it's just trying to figure out what, what happens if we don't start on, on time in the fall. What is that yeah. gonna look like? And a lot of it could also just be due to financial issues about what we can or can't do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think those are all very great points. Um, Greg Durham actually just shared that on his campus, they just moved to um, virtual summer recruitment programs. I think like most of us are doing those orientation offices are very busy right now. Um, but the club sports will be hosting virtual meet and greets um, for all of their summer sessions, which I think that's great. I know, for instance, at the University of Alabama, it's a very large production and so like our clubs don't get that one-on-one -on -one time but they are able any student organization is able to table and talk to the parents and talk to anybody while they're on campus and um, i would imagine they're playing with an idea of how to how to offer that uh, contact or that connection um right now but i haven't heard any announcement about what they're doing on our campus does anybody else want to share a little bit maybe about that recruitment piece that we'll we're kind of missing out on because of some of these some of these limitations I have to say, so I'm Joe Laughlin from Youngstown State. Um, we, uh, we've just been preaching to our club sports council and to, in every meeting we have, the recruitment starts right now because student, new students and high school students are online now more than ever because um, they have you know, nothing else to do. So um, just making sure that we're plugged in on social media and, um, and on our website and in every online avenue we can just to make sure that uh, we can show activity and um, show show that you know we're open to to new students, even though classes are you know nothing's going on on campus. So, absolutely. I think some of it um, too, is it like, we know what we know right now, but that doesn't mean that it'll be um, the situation that we come upon when it comes. Um, but I think trying to connect and, and respect the level of busy that all of these other officers are um, too. I think Greg made that point last, um, last round table with um, residence halls and move in and, or uh, move out and making sure that you respect the fact that they've got some other priorities, but um, just try to, collaborate and support in ways that we can um, and not get in the way. Well, I think um, we've got a few more minutes. I wanted to see if there's any topics that we have not brought up. We still have a few more questions to pose, but if there's anything that you all would like to hear as audience members or participants, um, we'd be happy to share that or talk about it. Um, this is also a good time for me to open up the chat for anyone that um, has topics that we have still yet to discuss. Um, we don't have another roundtable scheduled yet, but if there's enough interest, then we would be happy to um, put that on the books. Chad? Well, there's a question that came through earlier from uh, Crystal Durham about um, starting to advise dance team or a cheer team next year. 
Um, my only quick recommendation I always see or I help advise our dance team is treat them just like any other team sport. Um, they have they have one big event towards the end of the year, at least if they're an NDA participant, National Dance Alliance participant. But otherwise, they still they still do performances throughout the year. They still have weekly practices, and I would treat them just like any of the other team sports that you have. Um, they can have a robust budget as well with all their different uniforms and, and depending on all the different um, competitions or performances they go to. But um, like Laura said, if you have questions that you want to post to the group now, now's the time or, or post them in the chat so that we can come back to them if we are scheduled for another ideas in motion. And this is a, a good one came through. I'm going to say, you this can is take it, Laura. Oh, go ahead. You're fine. Um, Jacqueline Gidley uh, posed a good question. Does anyone have an attract potential revenue loss or expenses due to COVID-19? Um, I know that we at, at UT, I've been tracking just uh, all the different airfare that we purchased. I brought that up last week as well, but um, generally we're, we're asking each club to track if they had an event left to host, what that specific event budget would have looked like, um, as well as the clubs that had remaining expenses on their budget request form, because uh, we submitted those this past week. We also discussed and a lot of clubs have awkward budgets now because they missed their main event. So um, we're definitely tracking that. I assume others are as well. If anybody else wants to chime in. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to the impact of higher education, you know, of all of this is I think enrollment's going to go down and I think that our budgets are going to get cut. And so um, tracking that, if you're not already directed, might be a good a best practice for y'all um, as far as like expenses not spent or a revenue not generated um, just for future when you're asked to do, a, you know, a 3% cut or a 4% cut, you'll know where to start um, and then what the impact of that was just maybe a, a best practice recommendation well i'm gonna take a moment since it's kind of quiet i'm gonna do a, sh a shameless plug here so i'm having some struggles with the acha with our hockey club um on recruitment language and stuff if anyone has any recruitment language or that limiting the recruitment of students before they get to campus uh, for sport club eligibility or like sport club membership i would love to see that you can just email me and i'll put my email directly in the message that would be legendary As well, I see many people want to go to another roundtable. Um, we would appreciate any and all questions in the next like three minutes so that we can keep collecting uh, content for the next one. We can get scheduled. Otherwise, Laura just posted her email. You can email them all to Laura Thomas. Oh, okay, yeah, and the recruitment language, that'd be good. <laughs> well, we will um, stay on the line a little bit longer, but if anyone um, has last minute questions, that's definitely the time to do it now. We really appreciate all of you being with us today. I know that this is a new way of connecting, but in lieu of conference, I'm excited to see all your faces. Um, and happy to chat with y'all. Some, some, some people, some people in the chat were asking about if there was an update on the um, the sport, the intramural and sport club institute in the summer. I don't know if anyone on here knows if there's been discussion or if it's been officially postponed or whatnot. I think. Someone on the call has to have some information about that. Hi, this is I, Nick from NURSA. Um, we currently don't have an official announcement yet. But I bet they'll let us know when we do. Absolutely. <laughs> well, great. Well, thank you all so much for your time. It's been a blast. We appreciate you. Hey, Laura, can I say something just real quick? Absolutely. Yeah, you're, you're probably looking at this vendor in here watching a club sports symposium here for a while, but I love it. You're welcome. 
Listen, I, I appreciate you allowing it. I mean, I've gone, you know, 25 some odd straight nurses, so I don't get my nursing kick and feel. So thanks for uh, putting this together so I can at least just come in and join and see some familiar faces for an hour or so and, and uh, listen to, to some of the stuff that I used to talk about when I ran clubs for a long, long time. So thanks for letting vendors jump in and, and sort of listen to things that are going on. Yeah, we're happy to have you. It's good to see everyone. <laughs> Thanks for joining. Thanks. Bye, Laura. Superstar since 2007, 8, 9. <laughs> Bye.